Generation Y and Z, or Z if you're American, are currently on your campus or will be arriving in the next few years. They are closer to being digital natives than any previous generation, concerned about rising debt and career return on investment, and they'll be entering a labor market that will evolve immensely and not entirely predictably over the next few decades. So how are modern universities evolving to meet the needs of the 21st century learner? Here's how a dozen university leaders answered that question. Let's take 10 and take stock. Many episodes of this podcast have examined the ways in which colleges and universities are evolving and innovating. But this time, we'll hear directly from 10 university presidents and two administrators who I interviewed at the 2016 Ontario Universities Fair. Here's the question I posed to them with my usual eloquence. One of the questions I'm asking presidents today is, how do you think universities need to evolve, adapt, evolve? Uh, how are they? How need they to? Wow, this is why we edit me. <laughs> <laughs> to meet the learning needs of a 21st century learner, Generation Z, or whatever we want to call today's students. I suppose some might want to back up and ask a different question. Are universities evolving at all? People uh, perceive us to be, uh, you know, slow, you know, in our response and whatnot. There's a sense that universities are old, traditional, established institutions, and I don't think it's like that at all. You'll be surprised on all of our campuses, the sort of changes that have taken place. There's a continual evolution going on. There's so much innovation in the sector. Well, I think all universities have to evolve. We're constantly sort of adapting and modifying the programs. It's a sector that's not as staid as some might think. So yes, the consensus is that universities are indeed evolving. But there's also a case to be made that some of the long-standing traditions and core values of the academy are in fact timeless. When you're educating students, you're not educating them for today or even next year. You're educating them for life. So by design, you know, our, our processes that are involved are slow in the making. Modern institutions are making increasingly data-driven decisions about programs, services, and facilities based on market research and extensive consultation with stakeholders. We're really engaging the students and listening to the students in terms of where they're at. There's so much listening to what students need. So when we do student focus groups or we're talking to our students, our students that what they were answering five years ago is not what they need today. I think that students change over time. Students are coming with uh, quite different expectations from students that we have seen in the last 10, 15, 20 years. The student today is not the same student that went to university 35 years ago or 25 years ago. So there's widespread agreement that students are changing and that approaches to pedagogy are evolving as a result. In several episodes of the podcast this summer, we looked at the increasing trend away from traditional lecture and towards active teaching and learning in the classroom. I think the university of tomorrow is going to have to be able to adapt constantly to that learning environment. New learning environments. The learning environment has to be different. We have a lot of uh, students coming with a lot of new and different uh, ways of learning. What we believe, and I think uh, what the students are, are, re are, are requesting, is that different ways of being taught in the classroom. Uh, they do a lot of things that are very different from the time we were students. We've got to be able to adapt uh, to those students and to teach them in ways that will be meaningful to them. Bringing a learning, uh, active learning into the classroom. It has meaningful interaction with faculty. Combining individual learning with group learning. Multitask. So the conventional way of sitting in a lecture theater, taking notes, etc. I think is, is disappearing and will disappear even more over the years. And that's why we've invested significantly uh, in new facilities that provide for more flexible teaching and learning arrangements in the classroom. No question, there's one change to the modern classroom that you just can't miss. Today's student expects a learning experience that relies more on technology. Technology. And technology. Learning technologies. Digital connections of, of all sorts are a key part of education now. Both online and in person to person. If you walk into a classroom now or you walk into a learning environment now, it's very different than it was 20 years ago. It's not about the technology, it's about the learning. But so much of it is driven by that now. Certainly, if you don't evolve to take uh, into consideration the, the ways that students want to be taught, 
the new technologies that are being developed to allow teaching, um, you will fall behind. As students are becoming more and more comfortable with digital media, is it possible they're also becoming less comfortable with the printed word? I think it's true that students are more visual uh, than they used to be. But part of that's because they're in a much more visual world. I'm a humanities professor, so it's hard for me to say less reading and more visual, but I do think we need to go in that direction. There is a visual component uh, of knowledge and our interaction with the world that needs to be part of our education system and I, I do think that's different. In just the past couple of years, mobile platforms have surpassed desktop and laptop computers as a primary way to access the internet and students are arriving on campus with multiple devices. We're in a big transition at the moment. We were one of the first comprehensive laptop universities in uh, Canada. We're moving away from the Ford Model T to a bring your own device model. We have a whole bunch of apps. That everybody, every student can have an app on their phone. For instance, nursing uses tablets quite a bit because uh, uh, tablets are an effective way of uh, recording information but also uh, uh, pulling up information at the bedside. Kind of like the rest of us, students are increasingly expecting just-in-time access to information and prompt service from offices across campus. When we were doing support services 10 years ago, a student would come into an office, say, I want, to see a, I want to see someone to look at my resume, and they'd say, fine, here's an appointment in three weeks. We've changed all that at Carleton. We've changed our service model so that the students can come in and get service and get, get answers that they need. Ever since the Great Recession, students, parents, and government have become increasingly fixated on the career readiness of new graduates. Universities have responded by offering career-relevant learning opportunities. I really see value uh, in the liberal arts and science and what they give to the students, but I see that value tied into some real-world skills. You know, bringing you know, real-life experience into the classroom to teach our students. From my perspective, I'm very interested in the move towards work-integrated learning. Work-integrated learning. Work-integrated learning. Internship. Work experience. Service learning. Co-op community-based research, service learning, all those sorts of things, teaching, nursing, social work, all involve work-integrated learning. But in addition to co-op placements and work-integrated learning, universities are rapidly adopting another approach. Experiential learning. Experiential learning. Experiential learning. Experiential learning opportunities. Students are asking for hands-on experience. Rethinking the programs we've got to give students a chance to actually get their hands on. 85% of our graduates in each of the last few years have had some type of co-op, internship, capstone, or experiential learning opportunity. They're not only asking for co-op experience, they're asking for experiential learning that takes place on a day-to-day -day basis, basically. We've had some really great discussions at our Senate recently about what do we do to make sure that every student at some point has an experience that is relevant to what their education is about. And so that's filtering through the whole institution right now. The student experience is critical. Experiential learning is the way to get there. To meet current and future students where they are, universities are adopting new pedagogies, technologies, and experiential learning opportunities. But they don't just have to satisfy student expectations. We are providing, I think, a very solid base for students to uh, learn to be successful uh, in their lives after that but also we have to address what are the needs of the employees that they are hiring them. Nationally employers have been emphasizing the need for greater soft skills among new graduates. We also need to focus on the fundamentals, the communication, interpersonal skills, problem solving. Transferable skills that they can take from the university to the marketplace. And that step up uh, aspect that's leadership. But at the same time, university leaders caution that today's employers don't have all the answers for tomorrow's graduates. We continue to actually prepare our students for their future. And the most important thing that we do is really not to pander to you know, the immediate pressures because we know that the jobs that are dominant today did not exist 20 years ago. So if we just prepare our students for jobs that we see are dominant today, we'll be failing them. Many future graduates won't be working for employers at all. Self-employment is the fastest growing kind of employment. And in the so-called gig economy, Intuit predicts that by 2020, 40% of jobs will be freelance. 
in northwestern Ontario as well as Simcoe County, the, 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 most of the jobs are created by small and medium enterprises. And graduates who think about building their own careers rather than just going for employment. The thing that our students are telling us is that conventional education has not given them the entrepreneurship, the entrepreneurial skills that, that they might need. As I outlined in a recent episode on campus incubators and accelerators, universities are launching a variety of new programs to support student entrepreneurship. I think in our case, what we have to do is we have to promote entrepreneurial experiences and knowledge for non-business students. We support student entrepreneurship through seed funding. We do have an incubator program. We have mentorship and uh, we have entrepreneurship built into a number of our programs, gaming and entrepreneurship, for example. As you may recall from last week's episode on new programs, many universities are launching interdisciplinary research centers or interdisciplinary programs to prepare more flexible graduates for a rapidly evolving world. So what we know is that our students need to be more flexible. So therefore we need to actually give them in a much more breadth than we did in the past. I have graduates who are resilient and adaptable so that they can move careers. More flexibility built in the programming. Students know that they study science, they need to know science policy. They need to know the relations between business and science. They need to know the relations between the law and science. All of these things are critical, so we're trying to be more and more um, expansive in what we expose our students to. I describe our modular structure. We've also introduced a new undergraduate degree structure to allow students to customize their degree based on their aspirations, the specializations they want to pursue, or uh, opportunities that they discover while they're doing their four-year degrees at Laurentian. So, universities are transforming their classrooms, utilizing online and hybrid delivery, launching interdisciplinary programs, and focusing on experiential and work-integrated learning, while at the same time emphasizing flexibility and breadth of study, designing undergraduate degrees as a foundation for further learning. At a time when about half of all bachelor's grads go on to further education, graduate school and college post-degree diploma programs are becoming the presumed next step. I personally believe, not everybody agrees with me, that the days of you know, realizing your full potential with a simple undergraduate degree are over. Then I would like to treat the undergraduate degree as a degree that broadens people's horizon. And the next thing, whatever that is, it could be a certificate, it could be a master's degree that prepares you for your profession. I, I think turning the undergraduate degrees into professional degrees is absolutely the worst possible thing that we can do. Of course, how universities and colleges are evolving is basically the topic of every episode of this podcast and the theme of my consulting company, Eduvation, which is all about innovations in higher education. So rest assured, we'll continue to explore this question in future episodes. And thanks again for taking time with me. If you found this episode interesting or useful, please click like so we can tell. We've got one more episode to come based on my interviews at the 2016 OOF. Next time, we'll take a look at trends in new construction on university campuses. To be sure you don't miss it, you can subscribe to 10 with Ken on iTunes, YouTube, or by email. Subscribers to my free email newsletter will continue to get exclusive early access to upcoming episodes, a week before the general public. We'll see you next time.